As a continuation from our previous discussion about strategic issues, from uh, whatever list you create when working with the organization, we need to then ask these questions to clarify. What is the real issue, conflict, or dilemma? Why is it an issue? What aspect causes the issue? And who says it's an issue? Because maybe it is for some and not for others. What are the consequences of not doing anything? Can we actually do something about that issue? Can issues be eliminated or combined? Because remember, we can't spread ourselves too wide, too broad. That'll cause problems. Does an issue need to be separated into two or more issues? Is it one department? Is it an issue for one department or across departments? And, and just as we have a department of why and continually look at the purpose of what we're doing, what are we missing in this? Strategic issues show us the gaps where bridges need to be built to either reach our goals or fulfill the vision, depending on which tack the organization has taken. And at times, that means that the strategy has to be very broad because the environment is changing so rapidly, being too specific will hinder outcomes. A direct quote from Bryson, a strategy may be thought of as a pattern of purposes, policies, programs, actions, decisions, and or resource allocations that define what an organization is, what it does, and why it does it. Strategy, therefore, is an extension of the organization or the community's mission, forming a bridge between the organization and its environment. Henry Mintzberg wrote in the Harvard Business Review in 1994 about the rise and fall of strategic planning. The full article is in the doc sharing folder if you want to read it. Mintzberg identified four aspects of strategy in the above graphic. Intended strategy is strategy as conceived by the top management team. Even here, rationality is limited. And the intended strategy is the result of a process of negotiation, bargaining, and compromise involving many individuals and groups within the organization. However, realized strategy, the actual strategy that is implemented, is only partly related to what was intended. Mintzberg suggests that only 10 to 30 percent of intended strategy is actually accomplished. The primary determinant of realized strategy is what Mintzberg terms emergent strategy, the decisions that emerge from the complex processes in which individual managers interpret the intended strategy and adapt to changing external circumstances. Thus, the realized strategy is a consequence of both deliberate and emerging factors. And of course, a couple of direct quotes from Mintzberg here. Strategic planning is not strategic thinking. One is analysis, the other is synthesis. Real strategic change requires inventing new categories, not just rearranging the old ones. There are a number of ways to think about strategy, and we briefly touched on patterns already. With position, we're determining where the organization exists now in the marketplace and where we'd like to be in the future. Perspective planning relies heavily on organizational culture and would require a culture measurement tool. Osborne and Plastrick's book, Banishing Government, 1997 Perseus Books, discusses five key strategies of which the organization would only choose one. A core strategy sets clear goals and defines accountability. A consequence strategy creates new incentive systems. A customer strategy includes customers and competitors. A control strategy determines where decision-making power resides. And finally, a cultural strategy creates new non-bureaucratic practices and processes within the organization for better efficiencies. Often using a strategy as the plan by identifying opportunities is not enough on its own to achieve the organizational objectives. Developing strategies as a posture or a ploy is simply a means of blocking your competitors. Strategies to address the issues we previously determined need to focus on addressing the new rules, design, concepts, changes, technologies, whatever's going to change within the organization, creating processes that allow that activity to happen, controlling strategy delivery delivering future capabilities, and maintaining and enhancing stakeholder relations, the most important aspect. There are four basic levels of strategy creation. Remember, though, that strategies aren't tactics. Tactics or action items are short-term activities underneath the strategies that determine our purpose. Though, as Mintzberg wrote in 1994, the trouble with the strategy tactics distinction is that one can never be sure which is which until all the dust is settled. Strategy levels would start at the whole organization level, then move to subunits and individual program, service, or process strategy, and then, of course, operations, the functions that keep the organization running on a day-to-day -day basis. As we look at Bryson's 10-step map again, the purpose of strategy formulation and plan development is to make sure that our strategies clearly link together and link the organization to the community and the environment in ways that create enduring significant value. 
Let me repeat that. Because if we're not creating value, what's the point? We're looking to create enduring, significant value. This slide comes directly from Dr. Bryson. And if we start with understanding the social needs and the stakeholders and their interests, we then engage in strategic leadership within the organization. And then within the livelihood scheme or the business model of the organization, we're, of course, pursuing meaningful missions. And we're building and drawing on our core and distinctive competencies. But that helps us pursue competitive and collaborative advantages. Collaboration, particularly among nonprofits these days, is required. We employ coherent and effective strategies within the organization and our operations that produce desirable results, secure needs resources and cultivate support and legitimacy. And as you can see from the arrows, it's all interrelated. We are numbered one through nine here, but that doesn't mean that they actually flow always in a one to nine order. Many of times, of course, if you haven't secured the resources, you can't do the activities. Five key questions that we need to ask in our strategy formulation is, what are the practical alternatives, dreams, or visions we might pursue to address this issue and achieve this goal? What are the barriers to realizing these alternatives, dreams, or visions? What major proposals might we pursue to achieve these visions or to overcome the barriers? What major actions within existing staff job descriptions must be taken to implement the proposals? If we're creating new jobs and we need to hire more people, that's a whole different tactic. And what specific steps must be taken in the next six months to get us where we want to be? And again... We always continue to funnel down and to increase focus. What's really reasonable? Where can we combine proposals, actions, and specific steps? Do any proposals, actions, or specific steps contradict each other? And if so, what are we going to do about that before we start implementation? What, including resources, are we or key implementers really willing to commit to in the next year? Because if there is no commitment and follow-through, again, there's no sense in doing it. What are the specific next steps that would have to occur in the next six months for this strategy to work? SANG 1990 defines the learning organization as an organization that possesses not only an adaptive capacity, but also generativity, as he calls it. That is, the ability to create alternative futures. SANG identifies five disciplines that a learning organization should possess. Team learning, which is an emphasis on the learning activities of the group rather than on the development of a team process. Shared visions, the ability to unearth shared pictures of the future that foster genuine commitment and enrollment rather than compliance. We've talked about that previously. Mental models, deeply held internal images of how the world works. Personal mastery, continually clarifying and deepening personal vision. Focusing energies, developing patience, and seeing reality objectively. And again, that follows right along with Daniel Pink's work. And system-wide thinking, the ability to see interrelationships rather than linear cause and effect chains. Watkins and Marsick, both in 1993 and 1996, originally defined the learning organization as one that is characterized by continuous learning for continuous improvement and by the capacity to transform itself. This definition captures a principle, but in and of itself is not operational. What does it look like when learning becomes an intentional part of the business strategy? People become aligned around a common vision. They sense and interpret their changing environment. They generate new knowledge, which they use in turn to create innovative products and services to meet customer needs. Watkins and Marsick identified seven action imperatives that characterize companies traveling towards learning organizational goals, but they have three key components. They are systems-level continuous learning across the organization, not just in vertical or in certain spots. And that is created in order to create and manage knowledge outcomes, which three, lead to improvement in the organization's performance and ultimately the organizational value as measured through both financial assets and non-financial intellectual capital. Learning helps people to create and manage knowledge that builds a system's intellectual capital. From your Bryson text, the learning organization is developing a hierarchy of ideas from the more abstract values and mission to the concrete strategies, tactics, actions. Understanding the connection between values and assertions, beliefs, these are not necessarily the same thing. Using strategic planning as a component of a learning organization, continuous improvement. The next three slides are a process that flows together, beginning with our organizational values that validate our goals, 
from which we create the issues that we need to work on, which exist in the context of possible options and are supported by our assertions. As we go through the strategic planning process, we agree upon the organizational values and decide upon the goals, exploring strategic issues, discussing in context the options, the content, the actions, and the assertions from which we base our decisions. As we continue to move through the process, our values are served by our goals, achieved by our strategies through agreed upon activities that, again, are supported by our assertions. As a graphic, we look at where we are, start a strategic planning process that leads us to where we want to be, and we're continually measuring and revising the strategic plan, which is a living, breathing document. Miles and Snow in 1978 described three types of individuals within the organization. Prospectors continually search for market opportunities and regularly experiment with potential responses to emerging environmental trends. Defenders devote primary attention to improving the efficiency of their current operations and aren't looking for other opportunities. Reactors seldom make adjustments of any sort until forced to do so by environmental pressures. Dr. Bryson lists categories of outcomes from strategic planning efforts that you should see, from the intangible to the tangible or the invisible to the visible. And tangible results that you should see are documented commitments to work programs indicating steps, procedures, contacts, deliverables, stakeholder involvement in the process, data collection and analysis process and procedures, and procedural requirements and expectations. On the content side, you should see an adopted strategic plan that spells out context, mission and vision, philosophy, values, goals, objectives, performance measures, strategies, action plans, budgets, and how we're going to measure, how we're going to evaluate the processes that we're going to undertake. On the more intangible side, there are still benefits of strategic planning to the organization and to the community. Widespread appreciation of stakeholders and relationships, including value positions, interests, and political and psychological needs. Productively, how to work together. Effective conflict management processes, improvements to organizational culture, how we think about and do things around here. Uncertainties about relationships, values, and the environment get reduced dramatically, and the requirements for achieving legitimacy. On the content side, we should get widespread appreciation and commitment to the mission, vision, values, philosophy, strategies, and other key plan elements of the organization by not only senior leadership, but major employee groups and other key stakeholders. Now, strategy mapping as an exercise is a highly effective tool, though often the maps become too large to fit into any readable PowerPoint, as you can see from this example. Although the specific client here has been removed, this is a real strategy map for a large healthcare organization with multiple locations. Just from a surface glance, you can see in the upper left, mission, vision, and an overarching organizational goal and the values. Although I've blanked out the vision because in this slide, it, it lists the specific organization. We can see that the mission is living the gospel and witnessing God's grace while collaboratively leading people to healthier and more meaningful lives. And there's a goal to create thriving, vibrant, faith-based retail centers and outreach activities where individuals from all walks of life come to grow spiritually while enjoying experiences and products that promote healthy living. And then the values of the organization, faith, integrity, nurture, excellence, service, and team. And out of the goal, there is a specific measure, though the metrics are to be determined here. And they have a brand that they're working with as well. And the strategic imperative, if we were going into deep detail, is listed right there. As you move from left to right across a larger strategy map, you can see that the organization has chosen five key strategies to focus on. Collaboration, presence, people, product, and finance. Each of those then has a measurement so we can see how we're actually doing against the plan. This process for this particular organization has been going on for six months, in part because we're talking about a very large organization with multiple division heads and departments and multiple service locations. They will continue to meet monthly until they narrow down the specific initiatives that will fit beneath the strategies and the measurements and the metrics that will be used to guide the process and the decision making. Remember that strategic thinking, acting, and learning are more important than a particular approach. Bryson has several points regarding the process design and the action plans, beginning on page 245 of the most recent edition of the book, the fourth edition, but we're just going to touch on a couple of key points here. Evaluate the alternatives prior to implementation. Are the alternatives politically acceptable? Are they administratively and technically workable? 
Are they results oriented? What are we measuring? How are we measuring it? And will it tell us what we need to know? And are they legally, ethically, and morally defensible? That concludes this session on formulating strategy. Thanks for listening.